we consider an object with mass m that is either thrown or dropped in a vacuum, we know that since it is in a vacuum, that must mean that the frictional force or the drag force or the wind resistance on that object is zero or negligible, which means that there is only one force acting on that object, that being the force of gravity. We define this type of motion being the motion of an object that is only acted upon by the force of gravity as free fall, and we say that this object is now a projectile. It is a projectile because it is an object that is acted upon only by the force of gravity, or put more simply, it is an object in free fall. Now what we can see from this is that since this is the only force acting on this object, we can see that the net force is equal to the force of gravity, which means that we can calculate this object's acceleration to see that the acceleration of this object is always going to be a constant, that being Earth's gravitational acceleration constant. And what this means is that we can now rewrite our equations of motion where we replace the variable for acceleration with our constant for Earth's gravitational acceleration. What is important to realize here is that this section only deals with the motion of an object once it has left the thrower's hand or the gun that is shooting it. It is only dealing with this object while it is in free fall. So obviously there are external forces that are being applied to this object in order to accelerate it. But once it leaves the hand or the gun that it is fired from or released from, there is only one force acting on it, and that is the force of gravity. Now, as we can see here, when we throw an object upward, we can see that it has an initial velocity upward. We know that this object would typically travel upward until it reaches a maximum height and then start traveling downward again. And we can see that the velocity would constantly change. Because it's possible to travel in two directions here, it is important for us to define a reference direction, a direction that we are going to say this is the direction that we define as positive. We prefer to use downward as positive because that way the acceleration is always positive and we know that any negative value refers to an upward vector, but you can use the opposite of this as well. What's important to see here is that although the velocity of this object is going to be negative as this object travels upward and then become positive as the object moves downward, it is very important to realize that the acceleration of this object remains a constant of 9.8 meters per second per second and that is downwards. Irrespective of the direction in which the object is moving, the acceleration is always a constant downward acceleration because the force of gravity and therefore the net force is always constantly downward. So it is important to have your reference direction so that you can determine the direction of velocity and displacement, but the acceleration will always be downward for an object that is in free fall known as a projectile. The most common projectile motion problem is one in which an object is launched from a certain height above the ground. That object would then travel until reaching some maximum height, at which point it would start to fall downward until hitting the ground below the point where it started from. And you would normally be given some information. In this example, we are told that this object is launched from 150 meters above the ground at a speed of 17 meters per second. Our first step here, the first thing we need to do is define a reference direction and I'm going to choose downward as my positive direction which immediately tells me that that initial velocity because it is upward is actually negative 17 meters per second. So the first question that would often be asked here would be calculate the maximum height reached by this object above the ground and in order to do this, we need to realize that the object, when it reaches its maximum height, its velocity will be zero. We know that as it travels upward, 
Its acceleration is constant. We know the acceleration is a constant of 9.8 meters per second per second downward. But the velocity is constantly decreasing until it reaches that maximum height. Once we understand that the velocity at the maximum height is zero, we can use our first equation of motion to solve for the amount of time that it takes, the final velocity being zero, the initial velocity being negative 17 plus gravitational constant multiplied by the time, and we find that the time taken to reach its maximum height is 1.73 seconds. Another common question here would be, what is the maximum height reached above the ground? And for that, we can use our third equation of motion, where we now say that we know that the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus two times gravitational acceleration times the displacement. The final velocity here we know is once again going to be zero because it's the maximum height. The initial velocity is negative 17 plus two times our constant and what we are trying to find. And we find that our displacement here is negative 14.74 meters. That displacement being negative tells us that this object has moved upward, upward being our negative direction. The question would often specify the maximum height above the ground, which means that it would be the height from where it was launched added to the height that it reaches, so 150 meters plus 14.74 meters, 164.74 meters above the ground. The next question that is commonly asked is calculate the amount of time it takes to reach the ground, and we can do that by knowing that the displacement is only going to be 150 meters. Despite the object traveling upward, first we know displacement is distance from where it starts to where it ends, which is only 150 meters, and we substitute those values in again, keeping in mind that the directions here are important. And we find that we have a quadratic equation that can be solved with the calculator to find that our time is either negative 4.76 seconds or 7.53 seconds, where obviously a negative time does not make sense here. So our time to hit the ground would be 7.53 seconds. That is the amount of time it took to go up, reach its maximum height and travel all the way down to hit the ground. And the final common calculation or question would be asking what is the final velocity when it hits the ground? And we would calculate that in the following way. Final velocity is equal to initial velocity squared plus two times gravitational acceleration times the displacement. Final velocity is our unknown, and that is equal to our initial velocity, which is still in the opposite direction squared, plus two times 9.8 times our displacement of 150. All of those are downward and therefore positive, which means that our final velocity is a positive value, meaning the velocity is downward of 56.82 meters per second, downwards. There are a number of important things that we can take from this. The first is that the amount of time the object takes to reach its maximum height will always be equal to the amount of time the object takes to return to its starting point. So if we say it took 1.73 seconds to reach its maximum height, it would take another 1.73 seconds to reach its starting point, meaning a total of 3.46 seconds to reach the starting point. That is a given or a constant. You may assume that in a test or exam. And finally, if the object's initial velocity is 17 meters per second upward, we can safely assume that when the object returns to its starting point, its velocity at that point will be 17 meters per second downward. One of the more common places where we use projectile motion is in the bouncing ball problem, where essentially we have a ball that is dropped from a certain height and then it is allowed to bounce twice and then it is caught again when it bounces to its maximum height. There are three scenarios in which this can happen. The first one is in an ideal world. So an ideal world means that 
this object is going to bounce and the bounce would be instantaneous. So there is no contact time with the ground and also no energy is lost, which theoretically means that that ball would continue bouncing to its original height forever. And the way that we would show that on a velocity versus time graph is we would show that when the object is dropped, it starts with an initial velocity of zero. We have chosen downward as our positive direction. And so we say that that object accelerates downward, we know at an acceleration of gravity until it reaches its maximum velocity just before it hits the ground. Now, since we have been told that in this scenario, the maximum, there's no contact time with the ground, we show with a dotted line that instantaneously the velocity changes direction, the ball is now bouncing upward, and we say that it leaves the ground with the same velocity that it arrived at, just negative now. Once it leaves the ground, it continues as a projectile, meaning acceleration is constant, reaches its maximum height, and then falls down until it hits the ground again. Note here that the velocity is temporarily zero at its maximum height. Note also that it reaches its same initial velocity because no energy has been lost. Once again, the dotted line represents the bounce. And as the question has stated, we see that it reaches its maximum height before it is caught after its second bounce. You'll see here the dotted lines represent the bounces, so we can see that it's bounced twice. These lines should all be parallel because the gradient of a velocity time graph gives us the acceleration. Then for our displacement versus time graph, we have been told that the ground is the reference point. So this object starting out above the ground starts out with a negative displacement. We know that it would fall slowly at first until it strikes the ground. We know then the displacement will go back into the negative direction where it reaches its same maximum displacement as it started because no energy has been lost before returning to the ground for the second bounce and then bouncing back up to its original height where it would be caught. Again, important to show that that displacement remains constant from the height that it is dropped from. The second scenario that is common is one that still has an instantaneous bounce, but now energy is lost at each bounce. So we show that by once again showing the velocity increases as that object falls. The bounce is instantaneous, which shows an instantaneous change in velocity. The difference though is that as it bounces, it loses energy. So the velocity with which it leaves the ground is not equal to the velocity that it arrived at the ground with. So we show that by showing that also, once again, the velocity that it reaches just before the second bounce is less than the velocity just before the first bounce. And then once again, it loses energy before bouncing back up again. So as we can see, because energy is being lost with each bounce, the velocity is continually decreasing with each bounce. Note that this refers to energy being lost in the bounce, not being lost to air resistance. This is shown in our displacement versus time graph by showing that it starts with its maximum displacement from the ground, it accelerates until it strikes the ground, and now what happens is it bounces, but not up to the original height. We can see clearly that the new height that it reaches is lower than the original height before returning to the ground, bouncing once more, and then being caught at a height that is even lower than the second bounce. So as we can see, the energy is being lost, and that is shown in the lack of kinetic energy because the velocity is decreasing. Our final example is one where the bounce now actually takes a certain amount of time. It takes time for the ball or object to change its momentum as it strikes the ground and then accelerate upward again. So once again, this object, as it falls, velocity increases at that constant acceleration of 9.8 meters per second. The difference now is that there is no longer a dotted line showing an instantaneous change in velocity. What we now have is a very sharp line that shows that the velocity changes direction. Again, energy is lost, so it does not leave at the same velocity that it strikes the ground with. It leaves at a lower velocity before accelerating upwards once again, before moving upward once again and 
again not reaching that original velocity because energy has been lost and then we show again that contact time with the ground with a very steep horizontal line before this object bounces once more and reaches its maximum height again. So here we can see that there is now a period of time that passes between when it strikes the ground and when it leaves the ground. And then we show that on a displacement versus time graph by showing that this object accelerates towards the ground but now remains stationary on the ground because the object is in contact with the ground so the displacement does not change before bouncing back up to a height that is not equal to its original height at which point it returns to the ground and maintains contact with the ground for that second bounce before bouncing once again to that height. So the one thing that is common in all of these is that the velocity, the gradient of those graphs remains the same because that object is only acted upon by gravity and therefore the acceleration and gradient which represents it remains constant. It is important to understand the difference between these. The dotted line represents a bounce because it shows an instantaneous change in velocity where with our third example we show that velocity does not change instantaneously and that steep gradient there represents a rapid deceleration and then acceleration in the negative direction.